Welcome to Money on Tap. Money on Tap, your personal finance headquarters, where we bring out the professionals' experience and some fun in what we call three-dimensional investing, utilizing insurance, brokerage, and fee-based planning. That's what we do on this show. We look at all sides of the issues, and we bring a fully independent planning perspective to the table. It's Money on Tap's insightful Summer Sector Series, diving into the hottest investing sectors for the season. Each week, exploring a different high-growth industry, analyzing major players, market trends, and emerging opportunities with expert guidance to make smart investments all summer long. Your summer school session starts now. Welcome back. You're listening to Money on Tap. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. And uh, we're glad you are aboard with us today. And we're going to spend really the majority of our time today digging in to technology and investing, how to invest today in tomorrow's titans. Gosh, it's going to be so much fun. We've actually just in creating this show, the show before the show, where we spent an hour or more at least really kind of digging into the topic and getting this in, into a format that's consumable for you because that's really what we're all about is having some fun with the topics that we uh, we go through every day as financial planners. And this is going to be a really fun show for us to dig out for you. I'm Seth Crossman here with Ben Brayshaw, Dan Mickelin. And uh, before we jump in there, please subscribe to the podcast and share it with a friend. Be generous. You know, that's what life's all about. And we uh, we appreciate you doing that. When you do that, just make sure that you send us a quick note at info at yourmoneyontap.com because we want to send you out some Money on Tap gear. With that, you guys, how are you today? I'm doing great. I was I was thinking very similar thoughts as uh, as you were, Seth. And, and Dan, we were talking about all sorts of stuff. So um, I, uh, I kind of pre-phrased this show as the nerd show because this is where we – we get so much deeper into some stuff. I mean, I honestly would feel bad for anybody sitting in the room with us, listening to us, trying to understand what we were talking about, <laughs> the level of detail we were getting into and saying, that's not going to fly on the radio. <laughs> so this is going to be a good show, but I think we're going to get a little deep. I want to prepare people for that. But boy, in, in the technology world, that's what you need. Yeah, I'd say this is one of those shows. I mean, a lot of times we'll kind of go in kind of higher level, broad topic you know, things that we, we try and make it easily digestible. And I hope the show ends up that way. But if there's one show I'd say, you know, hey, if you're listening at home, you know, grab that notepad and pen. This is one of the ones you're probably going to want to write a few things down. If you're serious about technology investing and you're looking for some insight today, this is the Note Taker Show. Agreed. Yeah, speaking of show notes, we should probably do a little better job on that ourselves of creating some reference points for you as you're listening to things here. You can go onto the podcast and dig in a little deeper to some of our past shows. We do a lot of shows that are show one, show two, as we walk through some of the designs that we work through in our financial planning. If you didn't know, that's what we do. That's all three of us, Brayshaw Financial Group. And um, it just happens to be Brayshaw comes from, let's get into the etymology there, Brayshaw. Where does that come from? It's Ben's last name, in case you didn't get that part. He starts before Dan and I in the alphabet, so he got lucky and got the name. <laughs> I had to play one oh my role gosh. in the business. Yeah. <laughs> Without further anything, it's time for Money in the News. Coming to us first today from Fox Business, Danielle Genovese. Ozempic versus Krispy Kreme. Wall Street firm bets weight loss drugs won't beat donut sales. <laughs> And, you know, this title just jumped off the page a couple different ways for me. And I just don't think donuts when I'm talking about investing or reading about investing. So this this was definitely an attention getter. And then some of the quotes from the CEO in here I just thought were, were, were just really funny. I think a lot of people out there in, in pop culture and society, this Ozempic weight loss drug has kind of taken the world by storm. And, and for a period of time, it was it was major news in, in the market, not only for the manufacturer of that drug, but – you know, as well, what kind of impact it was having on, you know, fast food and diet trends and, 
And there's this level of heightened awareness and concern that just kind of popped up about, you know, the different things we consume and what kind of effect that can have on us. And as it made its way into the investment world, you know, some of those companies, you know, began to suffer through that temporarily. But, you know, uh, the Krispy Kreme CEO is, is making the long-term bet that, you know, people still enjoy their sugar. They're going to want to get back to things that they enjoy. You know, we've been through all of these, you know, better reading diet trend cycles and still – the indulgent snack market is holding in there strong, which is a sector I never heard of, indulgent snack market. But uh, he has it measured at $69 billion in the U.S. annually, which I thought was a pretty powerful number. Chappelle, I believe, is the name of the CEO. Don't be the person bringing a vegetable platter to a nine-year-old birthday party or an office gathering. Oh. Yeah. Bring the donuts. <laughs> Bring the donuts. <laughs> Well, I got to tell you, I didn't know it was a sector either, Dan, but we play in that area a lot. So <laughs> breaking it down, I'm not going to take a weight loss drug, but I may frequent a Krispy Kreme here or there. And I think it's interesting that we all know how to lose weight. Eat less, be responsible, don't have sugar. <laughs> like, But this is all about just you know filling the void of, of this. And I think the truth is, is that you know, we're a wealthy nation and we get to choose our Krispy Kremes and we just – we do it over time. I'm, I'm actually – I don't even care about Krispy Kreme, but that's not my vice. But my vice is sugar. So I, I don't know. I don't invest in Krispy Kreme. I don't invest in a lot of stuff like this. But it is interesting that there's really that much betting on the snack market versus the, the weight loss drugs. Uh, I'm a Dunkin's guy myself. If I'm going to eat a donut, it's going to be a Dunkin's donut. There's only two things I can recall in my lifetime from a, like a, a food perspective – that when they came to New England for the first time, there was those lines out the door. You literally couldn't even get into these places. It was Krispy Kreme, one of them, and Chick-fil-A, two restaurants that were forever huge in the south and other parts of the country regionally that when they finally made their way to New England, it was like everybody stopped and had to go and it massive, massive, massive lines. <laughs> Chick-fil-A, I love it. Krispy Kreme, I didn't get it. Yeah. Uh, way overrated. That was uh, going to school in uh, Virginia for Ben and I. I remember when the Krispy Kreme came there. And it was here, too. It was the Chick-fil-A thing, just like you said, and the Krispy Kreme. Those were the two I remember where people just went nuts over them. And actually, they, they were already there in Virginia. And I just couldn't believe it was such a big deal. These are one of my things, you guys. I got to tell you, this is a place where I can spend a lot more time than most people. Uh, <laughs> by that, if uh, we happen to get a dozen or a couple dozen of donuts, you might as well just write the whole day off for me because that's <laughs> I'm not going to go sugar, far. Sugar gonna, coma coming. Oh, oh, I love it. Now, speaking of, you know, Donut Palace, shout out to Safu. He's uh, one of our clients that makes the donuts. And uh, there's hands down nobody better in the industry than him. So wow. if you're out here, that's where we're going to go, people. Besides that, we might actually take a trip a couple hours away to a, one of my favorite places as well. But it's a, a good donut. I mean, like a really, really good donut. I'm over the moon about that. And uh, speaking of over the moon, not speaking of over the moon, GM announces <laughs> – who six, six billion share buyback now expects to produce as many as two hundred and fifty thousand EVs this year. This is Yahoo Finance that is uh, coming to us from Pras Sabramanian. A really fascinating story around the EV market where we've been watching what's happened as Tesla has tumbled. And uh, there's many other players, including this uh, Chinese kind of companies that have been knocking at the door here. But uh, GM has, has really taken a bounce here and announced that its uh, board-approved new share buyback plan to purchase $6 billion of GM's outstanding common shares is in addition to the $10 billion accelerated share repurchase program it announced at the end of last year, which also coincided with its plan to increase its dividend by 33%. Boom, boom, boom. That is in the makings of uh, some really cool planning going on. Yeah, you know, that's you know a couple of real good indicators. And this isn't a suggestion to run out and buy GM by any means, but can't recall hearing – you know, such good, exciting news about an American auto manufacturer in a long time. You know, two massive buybacks and a dividend increase. Sales are increasing. They've found the point. It's also referenced here in the article where they believe they can actually be profitable in the sales of some of these EVs, which has, has been a trick, um, you know, particularly for most of the domestic producers and, you know, kind of legacy American companies. I think Tesla's had, had a handle on that for some time. But, 
the, the sales are just really just picking up and I think they've picked the right price point in the market and that's that's part of the point of the article as well is they have the cheapest EV out there that has a 300-mile range and the, 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 the audience has responded to that whereas EVs in general have been lagging. You know, GM seems to have, although they took their time, they, they were last to market with an actual product. Um, but maybe that that's proven to work out well for them. You know, GM was kind of hit its bottom for the last 12 months, which is pretty low. It's like close to 25, and it's trading at close to 50 right now. So you've almost doubled your money if you know in less than a year if you if you happen to buy on the bottom in October, November area. You know, the market had pulled back pretty hard back then at that point. I mean, we actually made some pretty solid investments in, in our portfolios, and that GM was not one of them. <clears throat> I don't know. I'm, I'm just not – between the amount of pollution – and we were talking about this today. Like this is <laughs> – the amount of pollution from lithium batteries, you know, the, the fact that a lot of these electric cars, you know, once it's like 32 degrees or less, you're like dealing with troubles with the batteries anyways. I just don't know what kind of long term. Our grids can't support them. You know, I mean, it's just there's so many fundamental problems with all of this stuff that even if they do sell 250,000 ca- cars, it's like, man, how are we going to support all these things? I mean, and, and we've we've talked about this, like the only way to bring we've brought this up on other shows. The only way to bring the power to the station is is nuclear. I mean, nuclear is the you know this whole clean nuclear movement and all this other jazz, which is probably just a rephrasing of the same thing in a smaller rod. But, you know, it's like <laughs> – <laughs> and a hair less pollution maybe. I have no idea. But but they, we just don't have enough power to drive all of this stuff. It's just – it's really – I think we're, we've put the cart way before the horse I think on this – on the whole concept of this. I mean if you're, if you're driving an EV car, you're in Florida and your whole house is powered on solar and you're charging that thing with solar panels, you know, I applaud you. Like that's that's fantastic. I don't applaud the fact that those solar panels one day will – pollute some massive amount of earth that we don't even know how bad it is. We just know it's super bad. So like even all this stuff has to be analyzed. Yeah. One of my favorite images is the charging station for your uh, electric vehicle out in the middle of nowhere run by diesel generators. (laughs) That's going to do it for money in the news. And uh, when we come back, we are getting into some tech talk, investing how we try that again. Investing how to invest in tomorrow's Titans, you guys. Cannot wait to get this show going for you. Don't go anywhere. You're listening to Money on Tap. We'll be right back. Are you looking for personalized guidance to kickstart your investing journey? Look no further. Brayshaw Financial Group and our planners are here to help. Our team of experts will provide personalized advice tailored to your financial goals. Visit BrayshawFinancial.com today to schedule your free consultation. Brayshaw Financial, investing made easy. Thank you for joining us for Money on Tap. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or email us at info at yourmoneyontap.com. And now, more of this week's show with Ben, Seth, and Dan. Welcome back. You're listening to Money on Tap. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. We are in Tech Talk, How to Invest Today in Tomorrow's Titans. You guys, this show is one of those that if you're new to Money on Tap, you want to go ahead and make sure you bookmark it. Save it. It's going to have so much inside of it that you're probably going to want to, just like Dan said, grab a pen and paper, take some notes, come back to it, give us a call, and sit down and have the conversations that you need to have around this sector of investing, um, and in by and by no means will this show be complete, right? Because it's it is we are talking about some stuff here that really goes deep. It's broad and it's deep in terms of opportunities and ways to process and go through this information. And um, 
you know what? If you were expecting us to go ahead and uh, have a show that is like, you know, the advertisement on the TV that says, I invested in the blah, 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 which is probably the cues, right? In case you're wondering what that that might look like. Um, that's not this show. You're going you're gonna to get the information for yourself to start to ask the questions you need to have, not just go ahead and flip a switch and say, yeah, got it, done, moving on, okay? So with that, we hope you stick around. We hope, we hope you want to dig in a little deeper with us. Yeah, it, it is a broad topic, and you know, kind of the, the thing that got me thinking about this as a show was a phrase that you know, Ben's brought up a bunch of times that I think we share on the show all the time. It's like whenever we're talking about a different investment, you know, the, the question is, it's like, well, what is tech? It's almost like everything is tech or has some component of tech or is somehow dependent on tech in this day and age in particular. I got, a, I got a pair of sunglasses for Christmas a few years ago and, and they played music. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, is this a sunglasses or is this a, is this a radio? Yeah, everything's Bluetooth multi Did I give those to you, man? No. Was that for me? No. <laughs> no, I got thoughtful gifts from other people, Seth. <laughs> anyway, so it, 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 striving to define technology, I actually just Googled it and we looked up a couple different options. And, and this, this was a good one, I think, to, to kind of – to build our, our theme off of and, and carry the show forward. And it says, the technology sector is composed of companies involved in information technology research and development, computers, hardware, and software. So I think, and to Seth's point, well, that's a broad, broad you know, definition that encompasses many, many, many companies. And in getting prepared to do this, you know, we were just started taking a look at you know, a bunch of different companies that we know and, and seeing which sector they actually fell into as far as the S&P 500 is concerned. And it was, I think, eye-opening for us all. I think there was definitely some surprises for me. And one of the things when I mentioned, you know, at, at the top here about, you know, having that pad and pa- pen and paper ready for the show is we're going to be tossing around a lot of tickers, right? And what a ticker is, it's the three or four letter code that identifies a given investment, whether that's a stock or an ETF, so those will be kind of getting tossed around here a little bit. Um, we're not recommending any or a mutual any, or a mutual fund. A mutual Sorry fund. to cut yeah. you off there. No, that's a good one. Thank you, Seth. Uh, you know, just keep in mind these aren't you know specific little tidbits of advice, but these are things for you to jot down and take a look at and, and see if it's a fit for you. You know, if you asked me prior to our pre-show conversation, you know, what's the easiest technology investment to make? You know, what's the simplest thing you could do to get invested in technology? I probably would have told you, you know, the Invesco NASDAQ ETF, which is QQQ. Come to find out about 10 minutes later, that's actually only got 50% of technology companies in it. It actually covers the NASDAQ index, the top 100 of the NASDAQ, and it's got everything in there except financials. We talk about the Qs all the time because it's, it's kind of the staple, you know, of the idea of what technology is. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a common it, – it's just when you say, hey, the Qs, everyone's thinking technology. But when you actually break down – what the technology allocation is is significantly less from an official fundamental standpoint. I think that's the issue is, is we're, we're talking about fundamental things because when I say things like when I say things like Microsoft and Apple, everyone thinks tech. When I say things like Google, everyone thinks tech. When I say things like Amazon and Tesla, people think tech. But more of those companies that I just said are not tech. Which is really funny when you think about it, right? To actually think that, you know, when I think of um, consumer discretionary, I think of Walt Disney. But it's not a discretionary thing. Walt Disney is considered a communication service. (laughs) Like, how do we understand the fundamental? Like, when you're saying tech, like talking about the sunglasses, at, at some point in time, you're like, well, it's Bluetooth in my head. Like, am I wearing them because they're sunglasses or did I really just want to listen to music and not stick something in my ears? You know, I mean, it's it's one of those things you don't know. Like when you drive a car and you think about Tesla, I mean, if I were to ask anybody, is Tesla tech? I bet you nine out of 10 people would say Tesla's tech. It's not. It's a consumer discretionary. If I were to say, hey, Google, which, oh my goodness, Google, right? Who would think that Google or Alphabet is a communication service. Amazon, 
order all this stuff. We go on the computer, Amazon. Some guy shows up at the door. I've never seen him before, and he drops something off. And then the next day, somebody else drops something off. I've never seen them before either. I don't think I've actually had two same Amazon delivery people ever. I don't know about you guys, but I always think that's incredibly strange. But Amazon's consumer discretionary has nothing to do with tech. I mean, it's truly, truly phenomenal at the level of diversity that we're talking about. But but Apple, Microsoft, Nvidia, these you know these are kind of common you know tech pieces. You know, I I really did think it was interesting because I thought of Comcast and Verizon, and I'm like, well, Verizon I can see communication services, but Comcast like the internet, like, but yeah, because of the TV, like they are considered communication services. So. We have talked about this over and over again, just like, hey, what is tech in today's world? What is that? And Dan, you're right. I think 50 – it's like 50 – let me just pull it up here just so I have the accurate piece on the cues. The the sector weighting of of just buying the technology sector from the the cues – QQQ is the ticker for the Invesco – Technology holding is as everyone refers to it. For, refers to it, but it's not. It's the Nasdaq 100 top holdings without financials. Fifty percent of it's actually allocated towards the official technology sectors. Fifteen percent communication and twelve percent consumer cyclical. But I think it's interesting because you have you know Microsoft. This is and I'm listing off fifty percent of the total portfolio. Microsoft, Apple, Nvidia, Amazon, Meta, Broadcom, Google, or Alphabet. Costco and Tesla. So a Costco, I don't think is a technology. <laughs> like Costco, okay, one out of ten, I'm definitely sure that's not a technology. But but most of those actually, most of those are actually outside the technology space, which is pretty incredible when you start thinking about how its holdings are. And then you say to yourself, well, is this diversified? And it's really not. It's just the Nasdaq 100 holdings that are non financial. That's why it's so confusing, folks. If you can understand the nerd show here that we're talking about, like, what is technology? I mean, everyone's asking themselves, You, anything you buy has a computer, a hard drive, your cell phone. I, Dan, you made the point earlier, like, how many phone calls do you take over how many times you use it to surf the web or do whatever? Yeah, I think actually making a phone call or receiving a phone call is probably third or fourth or fifth even most common reason I pick up my phone. I mean, it's... Web surfing, texting, streaming. That's why you don't answer my calls. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. I don't even turn the ringer on. <laughs> I know. My I don't know who's calling me. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you leave your ringer off, you've proven the point. <laughs> Great points, all of them. It's fun to think back to um, what technology was and what it is now and what it's transforming into. And there really is nothing like it in the universe of investing. It's ever-changing. What it used to mean was it used to mean hardware, and then it meant hardware and software. And now it's completely transformed beyond that. There's the R&D of it. And it's got, I mean, technology really has become, like you were talking about, um, all these diversifications within the sector itself. Uh, so there's nothing quite like it. Changing faster than ever, still continuing to change as uh, as much as it does. You know, to really invest in the space is an opportunity for one. It has great long term growth. The store, this you know, the stories inside of the the, the sector have great long term growth. Uh, there's probably no other sector that you can really take a look at in, in increasing the returns and building a portfolio faster than pretty much most of the other sectors. And so with that, of course, why wouldn't we not get exciting? And the other side of that as well, it, I mean, with those kind of changes, it can completely flatten your portfolio faster than anything else out there too. Or send it, you know, send it south faster than anything out there too. Because let's like take an example. If you were to be uh, investing in RIM, which was the, do you remember the Blackberries? Right, mm-hmm. talking about phones, right? If that was your greatest play inside of the tech space, you are so sad today that that's all you were looking at for the performance and growth that you thought you were secure in getting inside of a sector that was growing as fast as it is. So staying on top of that, staying in, in inside of that, but in ways that you experience all that it has to offer, which certainly some of that will be some downside, but also what is the upside inside of that? So we're really excited about that. Yeah, Ben. Yeah, I was just thinking, you know, as, as you're talking, Seth, it's it's kind of funny. I was saying this at one point earlier with you guys. If we were to 
rewind to the 80s or 90s or whatever, you know, even 70s, we could probably define tech and, and everybody would probably be on the forefront of getting, you know, nine out of 10 right instead of nine out of 10 wrong, you know, <laughs> um, just because it was like, hey, here's a computer. Oh, that's IBM. Okay, tech. <laughs> Right. <laughs> right. You know, OK. Yeah. Um, here's Microsoft. Yeah, they do software. OK, tech. <laughs> it wasn't a huge space. Right. And, and technology has become interwoven at a level that makes this very confusing. And I think, our, you know, one of the things I want our listeners, at least this is one of my perspectives. I think we're all kind of on the same page here. But I really want to kind of pull the web out of, you know, the technology presumption and get people Is into that a play on there it was pull the web yeah, out pull the or, oh, yeah you know I wasn't even, no it wasn't but it was, oh, it was, was really good was we're gonna have to quote brilliant. that and pat that yeah. puppy <laughs> so I want to pull the web out of out of that and uh, I was thinking very spider like here yeah and really help people get a pure technology play like if you want a technology space without you know because we talk about this and I don't think our listeners really quantify how much this really impacts their portfolio but when you have like if you start buying, you know, the cues in, in your presumed technology purchase and you realize, oh, I have three things that aren't in the technology space and there are five things. In, like now all of a sudden the underlying stocks in those ETFs against maybe the other holdings you have all of a sudden create you overweighted in something. And you may not really have the technology play you're looking for. And I think what I'm really excited about is actually not just breaking down technology today for our listeners, but breaking down the subsectors of technology. This is where the nerd part comes in. This is the subsectors so you can actually pinpoint an area in technology that you really want to get exposure to, to, to really th- you think, hey, you know what? I think this space is going to be incredible. And so therefore, I, how do I get exposure to that? And that's what I'm really excited about with this show and talking about technology is that pure play. And I think that's the beauty of, of investing these days, and you know, with, with the the kind of rollout of, of the ETF, um, you know, as a comparative to the, the kind of wide, large space and mutual funds, is that you know, when you begin to realize what each underlying stock investment is in any of these kind of broader investment baskets, you know, we have the ability today to fine tune that to such dramatic scale. I mean, get really, really granular into a certain sector of an industry. But at the same time, not have to pick the single winning stock. And I think that is the exciting part of where we're at today. And I think those are the things we want to highlight in the show and give everyone a little guidance in terms of, you know, how do you narrow that field but still spread the risk out over a specific element of a sector with, with, again, not having to make that one winning stock pick and still do well. All right. You're listening to Money on Tap. We're going to take a quick break. In the meantime, you can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. Don't forget to subscribe while we're taking a break. And uh, while you're at that, send us a little love letter, whatever you like, at uh, info at yourmoneyontap.com. Yeah, because we got some Money on Tap gear that we want to send your way, too. All right, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back with Tech Talks and how to invest in tomorrow's Titans. We'll be right back. Hey, Seth Crossman with Brayshaw Financial Group. Are you looking for professional guidance to kickstart your investing journey? Look no further. Brayshaw Financial Advisors, we're here to help you. Our team of experts will provide professional, personalized advice tailored to your financial goals. Visit BrayshawFinancial.com today and schedule your free consultation. Looking forward to seeing you there. We appreciate you listening to Money on Tap with Ben, Seth, and Dan. You can contact us at 855-226-8551 or email us at info at yourmoneyontap.com. And now, more of this week's program. Welcome back. You're listening to Money on Tap. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. Yes, Tech Talk, how to invest in tomorrow's titans, referenced RIM, BlackBerry, right? Some of this stuff is great because it's just it's just off the cuff. 
you know, we're talking about stuff. We didn't, I didn't, we didn't prep that conversation or we're just kind of, as we do this, you guys, the secret in the sauce is that we really don't have that whole conversation. We're not scripting. We're just talking and having a great time and including you in this conversation. Um, and it, for those of you that like that, wonderful. Thank you so much. We appreciate all the comments and shares and likes and you guys sending, you know, this to your friends and family that just want to get included in, you know, what we're doing at Money on Tap at Brayshaw Financial Group. So, uh, you know, one of the things that we're talking about right now, you know, is risk and highlighting some of the risk inside of uh, of investing. You know, it's a it's a fair conversation to have when you talk about tech. When we were going through kind of the evolution that, Ben, you were talking about, hey, you owned a computer, IBM, or maybe it was an Apple. That's what we had in our Elementary school. I had a Tandy 1000 computer TX. lab. A Tandy. There, I, IBM, pretty much, right? Commodore 64. You remember some of those? But the uh, for, in, inside of school, it was the Apple IIe that was really the revolutionary thing that all the people were now able to afford. Not us, but apparently people at that time could afford those things. And we were like, I remember the typewriter coming out when it was a report time for school. And uh, when we got, anyways, so the um, sticking white out, I always ran out of white out tape. <laughs> this the standalone word processor, like, like dinosaurs, that thing. <laughs> yes. So the, the, what happened for us in the 90s when we were in school is for one, we got an email and everybody went, oh, well, what's this for? Why would I need that? You know, we're just going to go ahead and mail stuff, right? I remember no, that thought too, an, like, yeah, we got we got emails and we had um and we had these little computer labs that people were learning to do some simple programming and learn to type. But um the internet came along and most of us do remember our very first experience with the internet. And I mean, it was cool, but nobody was like really grabbing a hold of this most of the time, weren't really grabbing a hold of this seeing the future. But then technology really did start to transform. That's one of the things I think in terms of tipping points and exponential growth. We experienced those things inside of uh, this this sector of uh, uh, the, uh, the, the the investing sector. One of the stories, and many of them do come come to mind, but one of the stories was the Rim or BlackBerry story. Now, if you remember a BlackBerry, there was this you know Palm Pilot, right, or the Palm Trio, which was the company that was really on the forefront of cell phones and getting the keyboards out and being able to actually engage on the internet, kind of. And then BlackBerry had the, 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 the system that took over because you know, there was you know, kind of the end-to-end -end safety of it where that was a big factor. And so everybody's company had the BlackBerry. Um, huge growth story. And if you were a part of that, you know, travel along 2004, you're at roughly $22 a share. And in 2008, we're topping out at around 132 Huge huge story but today right if you take a look and you want to go buy it you still can um and but you're looking at roughly like what 270 a share um and the the funny thing for me is i take a look at this stock is today you can go ahead and look at a headline that says blackberry surges 16 percent uh, you know, as BlackBerry joins the Roaring Kitty Rally, which is one of those uh, meme stock kind of stories inside of uh, our, our, our investing today. So, yeah, maybe you can. I mean, 16 percent. Nobody's going to say bat an eye at that. That's great returns. Why? But the but 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 in terms of a real true opportunity inside of what we can look forward to, it is not the story that we talk about today inside of investing in technology, right? Those are, those are just kind of one-offs. And, um, and that's, again, fun coffee table, uh, coffee table or water cooler story, but, it's, but that's not where we're heading with our outcomes of what we want for ourselves or you as investors inside of, uh, of, of this space. You know, Seth, you said, you know, BlackBerry went all the way up to 220 and that was two hundred twenty dollars a share or whatever it was, but it's down to two dollars. Two twenty. I'm sorry. I, I, did, I meant it, uh, I meant one hundred, one hundred twenty, one hundred thirty eight. I think is where it's yeah. Out. So, anyways, I just looking at historicals, but there was a point in time where it was like well over two hundred, but it's down to two dollars and eighty seven cents today. Like it's, <laughs> and it's it's a dead company, and yeah. it's thank heavily, you, Apple, heavily Frost. shorted. 
Thank you, Google. I, I remember when Google and Apple and all them were announcing that they were going to create phones and like, oh, they're going to get into the phone business. Like seriously, <laughs> remember that? Um, yeah. You guys know what I'm talking about. I had a I had a Palm Trio at the time. Yeah, <laughs> I she went remember it well. I, yeah, I love the keyboard. I held out on that BlackBerry forever, man. I love the keyboard. Yeah. Yeah, you were, you were a big BlackBerry. I had a Palm, too. But the thing is, is that I like the days when my parents would send me out. We'd ride our bikes. We didn't have a phone. Show up home for dinner, and if you're late, you get beat. <laughs> like, you know, you like that, huh? You really <laughs> miss those days. Yeah. I mean, my phone rings constantly. I mean, I like I had to put this thing on silent, no vibrate. Like, you know, this... <laughs> Things were simpler then. <laughs> but but the, the the problem with the risk of technology, and I think this is what we're talking about is really the risk, is that we have these glory days of amazing stocks that have literally breakaway technology that's unforeseen, unheard of, stuff we never understood, like AI today, right? We don't even understand it. And companies are skyrocketing, rising. People are using it. They're making money with it. And, and then all of a sudden, somebody is more innovative, more creative, more capable – it could be a guy sitting in his garage programming right now, coming out with something that's going to make the current AI competition out there obsolete. And I think that's what we're talking about is that technology you know, has this huge, much bigger risk than probably every other sector, in my opinion, out there for people getting burned on the individual space. Like you buy an individual stock and you get burned. It's like you – know, I think it's the, the most speculative period we've been in since – you know. Guys will wander in the, the sands of Texas digging holes looking for oil. You know, There is just so much risk involved in that because the technology and the innovation and you know, the leader in a certain product line or the inventor of a new product line, it all changes so fast these days that you don't want to get caught behind. You know, if, if you're going to invest in this realm, it is one of those things that you, know, you really do need to, to be aware, you know, read the news, follow the trends. You know, stay ahead of the curve on the stuff to the best of your ability because things change fast. Nobody wants to own BlackBerry now. Yeah, no, exactly. And I think that's that's the piece that it's really hard for people to understand. I mean, we were talking about this off you know, off air. We were just talking briefly, it's like, well, you could almost invest in Apple and Google and you know, in our lifetimes probably not lose. And it's like, well, I mean, if we have a regulatory change and we were talking about that, like a regulatory change and, and all of a sudden Google can no longer be on the internet in the United States of America. You don't think that that's going to affect not only all the people who watch Google, you know, all the YouTube stuff and everything else. And, OK, well, now that's got all the people that make money off of that stuff. They're not making the – like that's going to massively impact our society. And so couldn't that happen? Yeah. I mean look, look at look at the whole TikTok debate and, and whether or not that's going to – you know. So there's just so much out there in the risk realm of owning individual stocks. It, do I think that Google could be a, a play like that? Yeah, maybe, Dan. I, I don't know, and I think that's the thing. It has all the components of it's probably okay, but it's just there's just a never without risk kind of investment in the tech space. Like everybody can be obsolete. Like I think it, it's kind of like like if you're you know if there's a company who manufactures steel, well, we're going to be building buildings forever. So you know at some point in time, you buy a steel company, it might it, it, it might really decline heavily and you lose a lot of money, but most steel companies are going to be around for probably forever, right? Google, maybe not. Apple, maybe not. You know, and I think that's really hard to say, even though they are such huge financial titans. Great way for us to kind of segue into, uh, and we are going to take a quick break here in a minute, but uh, taking a look, I think, in the in the breakdown of what it's going to take to be successful inside of investing inside of tech? How do you make some of these decisions? Is it a viable business model, financial strength, innovation, relative competitive strength? And when I think of like the relative competitive strength or a durable advantage inside of an industry, I think of Warren Buffett, right? One of the greatest ever. And um, how did he invest? Well, he was investing in looking for durable strength and competitive advantages, markets that could be cornered. And, uh, and stick around for a long time, long-term growth. And he was not looking for the cheapest companies. He was looking for great companies at a good price. It's funny, actually, as I say that, what has he been doing lately? Well, Occidental Petroleum and Chubb. So he is going the other direction, as Warren will, and um, in investing in um, petroleum, right? That's where he's been going. But 
he did eventually step out of the I'm never going to invest in technology model, which was what he was for a long time, and bought what? Apple, right? That's uh, That's been huge. And uh, as we understand more about Apple, we can see why he would do that. So we're going to take a quick break and uh, cannot wait to get back with you on Tech Talk, how to invest today in tomorrow's Titans. Don't go anywhere. You're listening to Money on Tap. Hey everyone, Dan Mickelon here with Brayshaw Financial. Looking for a hassle-free way to invest? Look no further than Brayshaw Financial Group. With Brayshaw Financial Group, you can start investing with as little as $100, enjoy a user-friendly platform with a diverse range of investment options. Visit Brayshaw Financial Group and start your investment journey today. Brayshaw Financial Group, investing made easy. Thank you for joining us for Money on Tap. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or email us at info at yourmoneyontap.com. And now, more of this week's show with Ben, Seth, and Dan. Welcome back. You are listening to Money on Tap. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. We are in Tech Talk and how to invest today in tomorrow's Titans. Technology, massive sector of the investment space. When you take a look at the S&P 500, it's broken down into 11 sectors. Technology is one of the largest today that covers so much ground. And as we've you know talked about so many of these companies that you would think, oh, that's technology, right? The Amazon, no consumer discretionary or uh, several others, Google, uh, you name it. Uh, they can be pulled into some of these other segments of the S&P 500. But right now we're talking about technology. And within the technology sector, we traditionally had some understanding around that. And as we started the show talking about how this has not only widened the space, we're going to get a little more expanded on that. Where does that take us? Well, you know, when it comes to technology, there's always kind of been three subset tech, you know, sectors in technology and you'd, you'd invest in, you know, software, hardware, or, you know, network data, data, you know, processing, which is network kind of, dating. That's, that's definitely one ne- of those. Network dating is definitely on. using software, um, <laughs> network or data center stuff, you know, the cloud world per se. Um, we, we believe, and, and we all have, we've talked about this There's probably way more number of true underlying, you know, subsectors of technology inside this. Those are the three primary that have existed forever. But we actually think it's really expanded into six hard sectors that may expand into more. But those those sectors are, are pretty pretty simple. We still have the the software, the hardware, the network, data, <laughs> Seth, or the cloud. We still have those three sectors. But we have you know we have this other sector that everyone talks about is the semiconductors, the semi. Um, and then we have um, cybersecurity has become kind of its own sector in the technology world. And then that beautiful new thing called AI, which everyone seems to be talking about and, and, and for good reason. And we – I say we, but I think, Dan, I think you really you know, kind of took ownership of that, was just saying like you know, it's kind of what once, – once you get – ETFs are those investments that are culmination of multiple stocks. So you buy an ETF and you have – anywhere from 50 to 100 or 200 stocks underneath sitting there. And and when you buy an ETF, it is very specifically and intentionally invested in a specific realm. So like if you buy a, a gold ETF, it's going to have gold miners, gold refiners. It's going to have gold transporters. Everything's going to be gold related. Well, you can buy ETFs that are very specifically cyber related. And I, I think that's that's really where I think is a really good litmus test to say if an ETF is coming out with a very intentional sub set of a sector, it probably is a subset sector now at that point. Yeah, it's kind of the tail wagging the dog, but you know, is there a sector out there to invest in? Well, as soon as the product exists, there is, right? And as soon as somebody's someone out there is is taking the opportunity to bundle those stocks that are very specific to that topic, well, now we kind of have a new sector, at least the opportunity to invest. I mean, the, you can mince the words here back and forth, but 
that that product exists that allows investors to get very very narrow and to take a calculated risk on something very very specific. You know, if you look at technology as a whole, I mean, we started this conversation with QQQ, right? We presumed, well, that's that's the technology ETF, the broadest one you can get into. Lo and behold, it's actually really fifty percent of true tech. All right, if you if you want an ETF that is the broad based but is really all technology. Now you're looking at tickers like VGT, IGM, IYW. So they get that notepad out, right? These are the things we're talking about. So those are ETFs that you can invest in that are truer to the definition of technology than is QQQ. From a broad scope. From a, Correct. From but a still, broad scope. That's covering all these six sectors, subsectors we just came up with and anything else that, that truly meets the definition of technology. So that's your – you know, I think broad scope is the right word. If if you want to invest in technology because you believe it's the the way to the future, but you don't want to dig any deeper than that. You know that you don't you're not really looking to take a, a bet on a specific product or or super subsector. Then that's the way to go. You know those those three tickers are opportunities for you to just cover technology as a whole. But then we, when we get into the six subsectors we've identified and we're, we're talking about focusing in on here. I mean, the hot one of the day, right? AI. Everybody's interested in AI. That's, you know, every conversation I have with, you know, non-investors or people who are just kind of feeling their way into the investment world or they just want to ask something of a financial advisor. I mean, by far and away, the most frequent question these days is without a doubt, you know, how do you get into AI? Tell me about AI. Where's the AI investment? And that's, you know, there's lots of options out there, easily found out there. But one to take a look at, you know, potentially is CHAT, which is the Round Hill Generative AI and Technology ETF, CHAT, CHAT. All right. So that's an example of getting really defined. You know, I, I think – there. Sorry. One second. I was just thinking, you know, Dan, with the – like IYW, it's like you have to go to – you have to go to Yahoo and really evaluate, you know, like how true these are too. Like we're not recommending any of these tickers. This is just trying to get people to more intentionally structured focus if they want to sector invest, like how to really like hone in and try to get as close as possible. But it's funny when you go to Yahoo Finance and you just click on the holdings, this is a real litmus test because what you can say is, is oh, wow, it's oh, it's 89.58% technology and it's still got 10% in roughly communication services, which is – Meta and Google, <laughs> you know, which are not officially technology. So it's it's just really interesting as you're breaking down this stuff that you get yourself aware on what your underlying holdings are because, you know, again, this has 16% of its allocation is in Apple. 17.5% of the allocation in the IYW is Microsoft. So it's very heavily concentrated. That's extremely heavily. Con- I mean, NVIDIA is 15%. So every time you buy this, that's the allocation you're making. And if all of a sudden you're buying the Qs and you're buying this and you're buying that and the S&P 500, well, trust me, the overlap in your top 10 stocks is going to be astronomical. You might have you know, 30% or 25% in just Apple or just Google or just NVIDIA. And if the bubble on NVIDIA pops, well, hmm. You'll feel that. Yeah. I was just looking at some of the uh, the tickers that you were talking about there, Dan. And um, and one of the things I love inside of this sector today is to be able to look at how mature it's becoming. Used to be like the tech, like we're thinking two thousands, right? There was the tech bubble. We've gone through that, and then we went through the oh eight oh nine, which was financial crisis. But all of these were affected inside of that. And today, where we're at is we've had those companies that have survived, or some of the there's even newer ones now, but they're very developed and one of the signs of their development and maturity is a dividend and as part of what we talk about a lot inside of our investing philosophy is really being in front of the macroeconomics of an aging population and what are some of the things that they're going to be needing they need dividends inside of their portfolio to support income and if you are looking to try to be a part of that story but still want to participate in the tech opportunity, growth opportunity that tech has traditionally offered. Yeah, there's a thematic stock, TDIV, TDIV, that is based off of technology and still offering dividend. And it's not, I mean, dividend like 
maybe some of your traditional dividend stories are as as high as some of those can go. But it's still an interesting way to try to participate yet potentially protect some downside in a uh, in a segment of the tech uh, segment of the uh, of investing that has traditionally been very volatile. Yeah, I think you know as we we think on segments and you know it's it's good to bring up Seth, you know if you're looking for income this high growth tech space is probably not the play. But you know if you're looking for growth one of the other hot topics has been over the last couple of years has been the semiconductor space. It's been mm-hmm. absolutely red hot. And you know they're building the chips. I mean, that's you could call that hardware, but semis have become truly their own element within oh, yeah. that space. No totally. doubt about it. Even though you can physically touch it, but you know some semi tickers to take a look at would be like SMH, SOXX. Yeah, you know these are two of the kind of brand names in that space. So, you know, if if the chips is the angle you want to play, there's a good opportunity there. You know, I know we talked about cyber. I know, um, you know, cyber, you know, CIBR, that's a, that's a first trust one. There's the hack. There's the iHack. There's, uh, you know, there's the Vanguard, you know, one. It's, there's a number of different cyber. I mean, cybersecurity, I think we all know, is just it's, – it's just a matter of time before everyone gets hit. Yeah. <laughs> And these companies, they have to buy it to protect themselves, yeah. whether they're under threat or not. I mean, yeah. they have to buy it. So yeah. the software sells. Right. right. They buy and, it. And the best software sells the most. <laughs> right. You know, so at some point in time, somebody's going to hack a new way and one of these companies is going to have the new way of protecting against that and everyone's going to shift over there, you know. And so it's 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 complicated. And yes, to, to that point that that hack, H-A-C-K, ETF, shows up as, as a leader not only under the cyberspace, which is what it's designed for, but it's a software product. And yeah. It shows up in the software ETF space yeah. as well. So you, you you have to watch that overlap. And I think I think we're not we're not recommending you go out and buy any of these tickers at all. We're just trying to give you some ideas that you can get granular if you feel like there's an opportunity in a specific subset. Like you're like, hey, I want to get into tech, but I really like cyber. Or, hey, I want to get into tech, but I really want to get AI. I really don't care about the apples or whatever. I, I have plenty of that. I own the stock. Or you know, how do I get exposure without getting burned? And I think this is the best conversation we've had in a long time about really risk mitigation is saying in technology – it's so much better not to just start selecting, you know, the big bang, hoping you get the next Nvidia purchase, and really just looking at the idea that I can get broad diversification in an ETF in a space that I know should do well over time in my mind. And I'm gonna I'm gonna buy this ETF that gets me into cybersecurity. I'm gonna buy this one that gets me into semiconductors. That that and let the manager figure out where the money's gonna go. Yeah, you know the the cloud trend, right? Your actual storage, where's it all going? You know these massive plants with huge infrastructure and cost, or is it all getting stuck up in the cloud? Mm-hmm. And the trend is the cloud, without a doubt. And a couple of good cloud plays to consider would be FCLD and IDAT, right? That's that's the iShares five G and cloud ETF. So if that's that's your play, if that's what you're thinking about as well. AI is going to create all this knowledge. It's going to draw our information. How does it work? Well, it's fed by the cloud, and then whatever it produces gets stored in the cloud. Mm. You know, so uh, there's a couple of cloud plays, and then you know we talked about hardware, which seems like you know the dinosaur in the realm here, right? That's like the the oldest throwback version of the technology space. But the, there's an ETF there, uh, XTH. You can take a look at. So yeah, the technology is, is one of those large sectors that can truly be broken down and, and with the evolution of ETFs, you can get so specific. It's just a wonderful opportunity. You guys, as we're talking about technology, all these different areas inside of technology, I cannot help but bring to the table a problem. And a problem, a real problem for technology is energy. Because as we are now going into massive amounts of data consumption and chips, yes, being able to process such huge amounts of information, but requiring still until there's the next one that doesn't or does you know requires less energy. There's so much required energy, and with AI consuming so much of the space now inside in these data centers and what it what it takes to actually run the AI world, it's it's an energy equation, and it is one that uh, we'd love to talk to you about as you're going through this process in how to support you and being successful in your investing. That's what we're about here, Money on Tap. Thanks for joining us today and having some fun with us as we have been 
in our tech talk and how to invest today in tomorrow's titans. It's an honor to be here. Thank you so much for spending the time with us. Be successful in your investing, and we'll see you here next week. All season long, it's Money on Tap's Summer Sector Series. Each week, exploring a different high-growth industry, analyzing major players, market trends, and emerging opportunities. Join us again next week for more smart, sizzling investment opportunities here at Money on Tap. The views expressed are not necessarily the opinion of this radio station and should not be construed directly or indirectly as an offer to buy or sell any securities mentioned herein. Investing is subject to risks, including loss of principal invested. No strategy, product, material, or tool mentioned can assure a profit nor protect against loss. Please note that individual situations can vary. Therefore, the information, products, materials, or tools mentioned should be relied upon when coordinated with individual professional advice. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. This show may be subsidized in whole or in part by a product sponsor or issuer. Securities and advisory services offered through Osaic Wealth Incorporated member FINRA SIPC and a registered investment advisor. All other services offered through Brayshaw Financial Group LLC are independent of Osaic Wealth Incorporated. Osaic Wealth Incorporated and Brayshaw Financial Group do not provide tax or legal advice. Main office is located at 116 South River Road, Bedford, New Hampshire, 03110 and can be reached at toll-free 855-226-8551. Well, bye.